Hi, it's Kernetex here again with the next in series of videos about installing Gen 2 on a Raspberry Pi 400. So if you've come here either because you've jumped from the introduction where you come straight to um, carry on using the 64-bit kernel provided by the Raspberry Pi Foundation or whether you've just um, come through the previous video where we've built the um, 64-bit kernel by hand with a cross compiler. Um, everything now should be more or less the same. There's a couple of slight differences, but they're just in names of the files, really. Um, but everything else should be the same from now on. So what I'm going to do, again, I'm in the Pi, basic Pi. Um, it could be just that I've rebooted it or just started it. And I need to go to the boot partition, the boot uh, directory. And for those that built the... Um, uh, kernel, um, or rather for those that didn't build the kernel of coming straight from the introduction, you'll see that the only difference is we've got a backup which is the original kernel, that's the one that you'll be using, but it will still be called kernel8.image. Um, and for those that built the kernel, as you remember, the kernel8.image is the kernel that we just built. So, what we've got to do is to swap the kernel over in the config. Um, dot text file. So if we load that up, um, just before I do that, if we double click the name of the image that we want to boot, so no matter whether you built your own kernel or, or not, the kernel we want is called kernel8.img. So if you double click that and then edit the config.txt file and scroll down somewhere near the bottom, in fact, if you go to the very bottom and type in kernel equals and then paste in by center clicking that kernel image name that you just copied and what this tells the Raspberry Pi when it's booting is that that's the kernel you want to um, load up so by default it, it knows which kernels to load um, so because we want to override the default we've, we need to tell it what the name of the kernel is that we um, wish to boot with so what I'm going to do now is to close down this browser um, and I'll save this, come out of that and I'm going to reboot the Pi now. And hopefully it will boot up in the 64-bit kernel, we can verify that when it's loaded. Right, my hard disk got plugged in, it's powered down, so it's just booting up, that's why it's hanging there at the moment. Okay, so we've got the desktop back, let's get the browser, uh, the prompt back up. So I'll just stick this up here. So if we do uname minus A or uname minus M, what we're looking for is this word here, ARCH64. If you're still on the 32-bit, then that would just say something like, um, I think it's ARMV7L. Um, so that shows that you're on the 64-bit LSCPU. You can also see here it says architecture, ARCH64. So we're definitely on the... Um, 64-bit kernel now, so that's good. Um, one other thing I forgot to tell you was um, on the boot in config.txt there's an option to um, uh, change the maximum frequency of the Raspberry Pi 400, so by default it runs at 1.8 gigahertz. 
you can actually overclock it to 2 gigahertz which as I said in the first video is how I installed Gen 2 from beginning to end so if you uncomment that and change this um, 600 to 2000 and save it um, if we do cat sys uh, devices system um, CPU CPU frequency and it looks like it's on demand because that's the directory that's there but if we do policy zero and then CPU info if we do max frequency you'll see the maximum frequency at the moment is 1.8 gigahertz and if we do the current frequency when it's fairly idle you can see it's at 600 so because it's on um, the on demand which we can find out by reading um, which one is it scaling uh, scaling governor You'll see it's on demand there and if you if I wanted to for example switch that to uh, performance then you can echo the word performance to this location and it will switch it to performance and the um, this CPU current frequency would immediately jump to 1800 at uh, 1.8 gigahertz and stay there so what we need to do now is to reboot the Python. So I'm just going to do a reboot from here so that that change I've made to config.txt is uh, takes effect also means I'm eking a little bit more performance out of the Raspberry Pi. Um, another 200 megahertz on top of 1800, so it's um, not insignificant. It's a, a fairly good step, step up. Roughly 10%, just over 10% in fact, so um, it's a, let's say a reasonable amount. So again, I'll get a prompt up. So again, I can do you name minus A or minus M, doesn't matter which. That, that's the bit I'm interested in, the architecture bit. Um, and again, if we do the cat scaling governor, it's still on on-demand. Current frequency 600 because it's not really doing a lot at the moment. And the max frequency has gone to 2 gigahertz, so it will step up to 2 gigahertz. If you're in any doubt, then what you can do, as I said, you can echo the uh, performance level you want so I want performance echo that to that location now if I do cat on the scaling governor you can see it says performance and not only that max maximum frequency is now 2 gigahertz rather than 600 megahertz so that's how that happens I'm just going to put it back to on demand which is a reasonable one it means that the Pi can stay cool when it's not being used and as I say if you're maybe using batteries or perhaps solar panels or something to power the Pi then um, you may be interested in on, on demand so that it's using less uh, electric when it's not doing so much so on demand uh, check the governor set to on demand and again if I do the um, current frequency you can see it's gone back to 600 megahertz so that's that so really what I need to do next is to start with the actual gen 2 build itself so let's get ready for that now now there are some aspects which are going to be different um, as we've seen the kernel um, I won't be using the one from Gen 2 because it's virtually a vanilla one with a few adjustments made by the Gen 2 team um, there's no grub or any other sort of bootloader because of the way the Pi boots it's like kind of like a fixed way like it knows where to boot from what files to look for so um, that's not used um, I can't think there's anything else off the top of my head that um, it's significantly different at least um, 
So let's go to the Gen 2 handbook in the search. Oops, it's my book, it's my book properly. Well, let's find it anyway. Now you notice there isn't any ARM architecture here. Um, that's because it's still um, in beta, it's still being worked on basically. So what we can do is we can follow the AMD 64 and just make changes um, that as appropriate as we go through. Um, so the first bit is an introduction. It tells you what's going to happen as part of the installation. Choosing media and so on. It tells you minimum spec, etc. Um, let's see. That's about getting the media. So this, I think this is about getting some media to boot a PC on that hasn't got any operating system on. Well, obviously we've got an operating system already because we've got the Pi, with, uh, Raspberry Pi OS we've used. Um, network detection, we've got network access. I know that because I've already installed some packages from apt. So we can skip all this. Um, so we we'll move on to preparing the disk. So if I do um, F disk minus L, you can see I've got a uh, drive here, SDA, which is um, brand well, not this is not brand spanking It's quite an old drive actually, but it's uh, blank basically. It's, it's as new. It's got nothing on it. It's ready to be used. And what I'm going to do is to create a partition layout that's similar to the one the Pi's got. The only exception is I'm going to add a swap partition. Um, so I'm going to have a, a boot partition similar to what the Pi's got. So if we did DF minus H, you can see we've got a 256 megabyte boot partition. And we've got a root partition. As I say, I'm going to add in a swap partition. That's the only differences to the examples that are here. Um, there's no UEFI with uh, Raspberry Pi. Therefore, there's very little to be gained in using GPT. So I'll be using the old-fashioned MS-DOS partitioning. So that means if you do want more partitions, you have to bear in mind that you can only have four primary partitions. And that if you wanted more, you'd have to make one of them an extended partition to allow you to use that um, to install further partitions as containers within that um, ex extended partition. So you can obviously read all this that I've been skipping through. Um, I'm just going to use a simple F disk to partition it. In fact, probably something similar to what they've got here, where they've got a swap. Um, looks like a boot, um, maybe a boot. Sure, what I've got there for the layout. I'll boot partition, swap partition, and root partition. Yeah. Oh, they've got four partitions. Oh, because they, they've got an EFI system. Yeah, so that's the one we won't use. So, yeah, so what I'll do is start by doing fdisk slash dev slash sda, which is the first drive. And we get this menu come up, little message. Type P, you can see there's information about the drive configuration. And what I want to do first of all is do N for new, new primary, default partition one. Take the default sectors, first sector, and I want to make it 256 megabytes. So I just do plus 256M and it will calculate the last sector. And you can see it's created partition one of type Linux and size 256. And I can do P to print that up, and you can see there's a size there. What I'm going to, need to do is change the type because we don't want a Linux partition. It's got to be a DOS partition, a FAT32 partition for the boot partition on the Raspberry Pi. Not sure what the code is. Press L, and that's the option we want there the LBA version of the FAT32 because we've got a big disk here. So just put C in. And you can see it's changed it to Windows 95 FAT32 
brackets LPI. Next partition, um, primary again. So it knows the next one available is two, so we'll accept that default. First sector, it selects the first available sector. And then the um, size of the swap drive. Now it really depends on how big you think your packages are going to be that you um, are going to compile. As I said, Qt Web Engine needed two and a half gigabytes uh, per process at one point during the build. So um, even if you ran it at one um, process, which is really extremely slow for the whole of the build, um, it's going to use, still use up quite a lot of space of memory you'll have some spare but if you're looking thinking about taking a chance and having the swap being used for that the period where those large processes are being run then it is going to be thrashing the disk for that time and you'll definitely want at least a gigabyte maybe two gigabytes of swap space so leave that up to you what you want but whichever you choose you can again do plus I'm going to use one gigabyte plus one G for one gigabyte and there you go it's created a partition of size one gigabyte again that's the wrong partition type I want to tell it that it's actually a swap partition so again I can use T select the partition default is 2 it's the last one I entered so I'll just accept it again if you're not sure what code it is you can do L and the one I'm looking for is code 82 Linux swap so I'll just type 82 in there and you can see it's changed to Linux swap or Solaris so I'll do a P again, you can see that's now been updated. Finally, I need the root partition. So again, I'll do N for new, P for primary, accept the next partition number, which is three, accept the first sector. And unless you're going to put other partitions on here, you can just press enter straight away and it will allocate the rest of the disk automatically. And it's already given us the correct partition type, type 83 for Linux. So that's it, just press W for write, and that's written. Now the reason why I made my swap the second partition, it might seem counterintuitive, is because this is a rotating disk and the sectors um, can be read from a lot faster on the outside of the disk, where, which is where the first sectors are allocated from so like sector zero or sector one is the first one on the outer cylinder of the disc and then as we go further inwards there's got to be more ro more rotations to the disc to read the same amount of data um, so that slows things down so when it's swapping i want the maximum performance possible obviously if you've got an ssd um, you may want to think about putting a swap on there um, so in that case, it wouldn't matter where you put the swap partition, but certainly for a rotating disk, um, you do want to consider putting the swap at the beginning of the partition layout. So let's carry on. We've created partitions now, I think somewhere in, in amongst here. Yeah, it tells us about formatting them. So they're just empty partitions with no data in. We need to format them to give them like um, uh, an index, a way it knows um, how to store files and keep track of files. So funny enough, the first command I want to do to format the boot partition, which is FAT32, is this exactly this command here. So let's put that in. So what this is saying is I want to format the partition using the VFAT system. It's the 32-bit version of the VFAT, and I want to format dev sda one which is going to be the boot partition. So I'll just print enter there and it's done it already. It's quick because it's a tiny partition. The next I want to do is the um, root partition, which again is the same dev SDA3. You can see this SDA3 is the root partition. So again, I can just copy and paste this in. Oops, that's because I've highlighted this here. So I'll just highlight that again. And this will take a little bit longer.
Okay, that's done. And now we want to make the swap partition. So once again, because my partitions match with what's in the book, I can just copy and paste these commands, make a swap drive on uh, the second partition, and it's done. And also you'll note it's giving us a, a command here to turn it on. So we can do that. We can turn it on immediately. And if you type swap on by itself, you can see that there's a default swap file, which has been set up as part of the Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, like default setup. Now you probably want to get rid of that because that file will be residing on the SD card, so it'll be slow, very slow. And secondly, file systems, uh, swap file systems are, are slightly slower than swap partitions because they've got to go through the file system layer. So it's going to have a slight hit on performance for that reason. So what we can do here is to swap off and that name there, oops, just once. And again, if we do swap on, or you can do cat proc swaps, it shows you the information in a different layout. Um, you can see we've just got that swap partition. So that means if we do run out of physical memory, um, and it's very unlikely because we've got four gigabytes just building up the basic Gen 2 system. But if we did, we've got the um, fastest possible swap drive or, for, or swap partition, sorry. Um, it's at the beginning of the disk, so it'll be fast because of the sectors. And it's also a partition, so it'll be fast from that point of view. As fast as a swap drive or swap partition can be anyway. So the next thing we need to do is to mount the root partition. Uh, now this is assuming it, that we've booted from a Gen 2 um, bootable medium, which we haven't done. So because it assumes that, it assumes this MNT Gen 2 uh, directory exists, which it won't do on here. So if I list the MNT partition, you can see it's empty. So what we should do first is make that directory and now we will be able to mount our well what will be our gen 2 root system onto that directory so if we do df minus h now you can see there it is at the bottom it's 1.4 terabytes 77 meg has been used by the file system effectively and it's mounted on mnt gen 2 um, if temp needs to reside on a separate partition um, it says something there about changing uh, permissions. Um, I'm not going to bother with that. It might be an idea if you want to prevent any temporary files being created on the SD card, maybe for performance or for space reasons. Um, but, well, you can see the route I've got here. I've got 128 um, gigabyte uh, SD card in. So there's plenty of space. So the only issue I would maybe worry about is um, running uh, the temp directory on the SD card would make some temporary operations slower, but uh, I wouldn't have thought it would make a considerable difference. So I'm not going to worry about that. 